welcome everybody who's joined us online and a special welcome to Senator Maureen Faruqi. We really appreciate your time. It is an incredibly busy period for you right now. We understand that. So thank you very much for joining us today or tonight. Um, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're meeting for myself, that is the Willem Willem mob of the Wurundjeri people, of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I also acknowledge that this land was never ceded. So welcome, Senator, and thank you very much for being here. Um, could we start off with just a perhaps a brief overview of the Greens education policy? Yeah, absolutely. It. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Sharon. Um, very lovely to be here with all of you. Um, I also would like to start by acknowledging the sovereign owners of the many lands that we're zooming in from. I live and work on Gadigal land and I pay my respects to elders past and present. This is, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, the Greens are proudly the party of public education. And for me, it's a real honor to be the Green spokesperson in education and a real privilege as well to be here with all of you today. Um, as you well know, it is no secret that public schools are being left underfunded and under-resourced. Um, a decade has passed since the Gonski report was handed down, but the disparity between school funding has sadly only increased since then. Um, under current federal government policy, public schools will only ever be funded at 91% of the Gonski schooling um, resource standard, and they won't reach that level until 2030. Um, and we know at, uh, at the same time as this is happening, where public schools are being systematically underfunded, the wealthiest private schools are receiving cash splashes. Um, you might know that recently an analysis from a report released by the New South Wales Teachers Federation actually revealed the true schooling resource standard funding gap per student for public schools in New South Wales is over $2,000. Um, I find that to be gobsmacking and really infuriating. Um, and the Liberal government's attack on public schools, I, I thought, reached new heights in recent weeks with the acting federal education minister deciding to insult public school teachers instead of taking responsibility for the coalition's failure to deliver needs-based funding. Um, Australia ranks quite poorly in o OECD with respect to funding resource equity. And governments of both stripes, I think you have to say that Liberal and Labour have given billions to private schools. Um, at the same time, public schools are desperate for resources. Um, just in the latest budget this year, which was announced what, a month and a bit ago, uh, funding for public schools has actually reduced by $559 million over the next three years, uh, while private schools received an enormous increase of more than $2 billion. Um, from where I sit, this is just obscene and it points to the calculated neglect of public schools. Um, I know that, you know, it, it, it is really difficult um, when you represent families and communities you're, um, of more than 2.6 million children attending government schools in Australia. Your job is made, made harder with each cut. Uh, and we know that public schools teach some of the most disadvantaged students on shoestring budgets with stretched resources and inadequate infrastructure. Um, and the Greens really are the only party advocating for fair funding for government schools to come first with public money. Um, and we will, we will cancel special deals made with cashed up private schools. Um, and I can assure you that I will not stop until school funding is, is made fair, no matter how much the Murdoch media attack me for questioning the overfunding of private schools and the underfunding of public schools. Um, it really does blow my mind that education funding remains a contested space in Australia, with neither major party offering any vision for public education. And it saddens me to say that coalition and labor are on a unity ticket so far as unfair private school funding is concerned. Um, so the Greens have gone to this election with a platform uh, which has a fully costed plan to invest $32 billion in our public schools over the next decade to achieve 100% funding for the schooling resource standard for public schools by 2023. Under our plan, the Commonwealth contribution to the SRS will increase to 25%, ensuring that all public schools receive the funding needed to provide a quality education to their students. 
We will also remove the 4% capital depreciation tax in school funding bilateral agreements and work with states and territories to ensure that they maintain their commitment to funding at least 75% of SRS. Um, so, like I said, this makes the Greens the only party with a plan to guarantee all public schools are fully funded to meet the needs of their students and teachers. To make federal school funding truly equitable, we will abolish the Liberals' $1.2 billion choice in affordability, which I call a slush fund for private schools and end the special deals that are keeping private schools overfunded for most of this decade. And as part of our universal and early childhood education and care plan, we will also make um, out of school hours care free and universal. With too little funding, out of pocket costs for parents, you would know better than most have become enormous. Parents and guardians feel pressured to pay hundreds, sometimes even thousands of dollars in voluntary fees. In some cases, parents are asked to fund classroom basics like paper and technology, and this cannot go on. I believe public schools should be genuinely free, and no parent or guardian should feel pressured to pay these costs. Um, this is why, again, we, with the Parliamentary Budget Office, we have costed a plan to add $16.9 billion to abolish out-of-pocket costs for public schools. Our plan recognizes that activities like art, sport, and music are essential parts of going to school and should be funded as such. Um, and now I come to infrastructure. We know that public schools around the country are suffering under aging infrastructure. Demountable, demountables are becoming the norm rather than the exception. And the Liberals have deepened the school infrastructure crisis by entirely excluding public schools from the capital grants program at the federal level. The Greens will increase the capital grants fund to $400 million a year to fund critical infrastructure for schools and set aside at least 80% of this funding, which is $320 million for public schools, to ensure that they have safe, accessible, and modern learning environments. And we also want to set aside a $5 billion green education infrastructure fund, which schools will be able um, to access. You know, education is important no matter who you are or where you live. I was lucky to grow up in a household in Pakistan where my father valued education above all. For him and my mother, the most important thing in, um, in the upbringing of their two sons and two daughters was the best quality education that they could provide us. And not necessarily for the purpose of getting good jobs and earning a good income, which are of course important, but more for acquiring knowledge, broadening our hearts and minds, and learning how to think um, critically. And these are all skills desperately needed, especially in today's world where fake news really proliferates and the line between fact and fiction can often become quite blurred. So for me, education has been a way of life, um, but for the inspirational Pakistani hero, Malala Yousafzai, the battle for that right almost cost her her life. Uh, when at point blank range extremists used terrible violence with the intention of suppressing a girl and her dangerous ideas. But instead, the bullets fired to silence her caused her voice to reverberate around the entire globe, and it still is. Um, and coming to Australia, you know, more than 100 years ago, Henry Parks created Australia's first comprehensive public education system in New South Wales with the underpinning philosophy that every child regardless of their family's wealth or poverty, irrespective of the religion practiced by their parents and without prejudice for their level of ability, would have access to the world's best schooling. So egalitarian, secular, democratic. These principles and ideals still hold as true as they did more than a century ago. But sadly, the reality in Australia has become quite different where educational inequality is becoming entrenched um, this must change. A truly free, high quality public school education available to every young person in Australia is completely achievable. This is what the Greens want to deliver. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you, Maureen. Well, that's music to our ears here at AXO, that's for sure. I think you align very well with what we believe too, in that every child, no matter what their background is or where they live or their postcode, 
they deserve to get a really top quality education that our government should be, or governments at all levels should be funding properly. So it's really, um, yeah, aligns with what we would like to see. So that's great. Now we've got some questions mm -hmm. you're happy to take. Yeah, um, sure. yeah our first is um, a bit of a two-parter. Mm -hmm. From uh, Rabbi Zelman Castle, who's the founder of Together for Humanity, mm -hmm. um, which promotes intercultural understanding. And so mm -hmm. Zelman's question is, would the Greens be supportive of changes to education to reduce bigotry by A, ensuring the content of the curriculum includes deep understanding of diverse worldviews and cultural experiences, including but not limited to diverse religions? And part B, by shifting accountability from mainly numeracy and literacy to also require schools to demonstrate effective strategies for fostering intercultural understanding. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good question. And I think you know, we live in such a multicultural country. I, I find that's one of the most beautiful things about Australia. You know, more than 50% of us uh, were either born overseas or our parents were born overseas. So, of course, the curriculum, um, you know, and, and how we, we teach in schools must um, be, um, must provide a more intercultural understanding and an understanding of our own colonial history as well. Um, we still, frankly, don't teach our kids about First Nations and um, their culture and history, let alone the people who came after colonization and their culture and history. So I think that's really important there. There are really other things as well that need to be included in curriculum. And one of those things which now the government has promised is you know, the respectful relationships and consent education. Uh, and, but again, you know, we, we need to make sure that that becomes available to, uh, to students in a way that, that is kind of uh, cognizant of um, their diverse cultures as well. Um, but it is really, really crucial that we deliver this particular aspect of uh, um, respectful relationships to be age appropriate, um, you know, through whole of school and evidence based um, programs in public schools. Um, so it's an absolutely they, I mean, there is, um, I have to say, when I came to Australia in 1992, it's been quite a long time, even I'm surprised when I say that. Um, I did kind of have a feeling that Australia had worked hard, people here had worked hard for an egalitarian society and, and an understanding um, of, um, you know, where different people were, were coming from. But over time, and especially I think in the last 20 years, that kind of understanding has, has dimmed a little bit. And I think um, politicians have actually used the um, the differences and div to divide us rather than to appreciate and respect each other. Um, and, you know, these sorts of things do should start early um, in school. You know, when we talk about consent, we say it should respectful relationships should start early. And so should the understanding and respect uh, for other cultures. Yes, and I would think they are both things that ought to be embedded in every part of every classroom and yeah. everyday life for that matter. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the second question from Zalman, um, you, you've possibly already addressed, but I'll in, in your intro, but I'll ask it anyhow. Um, post lockdown, parental anxieties about what their children have missed is creating a boom for private tutoring. Mm. This is placing enormous additional stress on our young people and widening the gap between rich and poor. Mm. How would the Greens address this issue, removing the stress and levelling the playing field? Mm. Um, you know, I think, yeah, absolutely. There is a lot of kind of emphasis on, you know, scores and eight hours and um, you know, assessments of students and then, you know, how students get ahead, how they get into uni, how, how they might be able to get in a good private school or a selective school. And I think this is stressful for parents and it is stressful for children. And I think we really need to kind of rebalance our view of education um, and, and its purpose, to be really frank. So it is about kind of rethinking where, where the emphasis should be with the especially during COVID and the, the technology kind of um, gap is also uh, was made pretty clear um, between uh, people who could afford the technology for kids to, you know, study from home 
um, during lockdowns and those who couldn't. So, and, and again, you know, that, that kind of shows the difference uh, between um, how the gap rather between really rich private schools and, and public schools. I mean, at the end of the day, it does come down to how we are actually resourcing or not resourcing our public schools. I mean, pa if parents are confident that schools and teachers are resourced properly, um, then you know there there would be absolutely no need to turn to private tutoring. Um, but because of so much underfunding, you know, we know the teachers have had to kind of dip into their pockets to provide you know basic equipment. Uh, for uh, uh, for for their students, I mean, this is like a, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Um, it just is so unacceptable that that is happening. But it is a bit of an ideological issue um, um, at the moment with the liberal government, especially. And I have to say, like you know, the other major party as well. There is not not too much difference in terms of how they think about private schools. Um, but I'm still hoping that there will be a change in government. Um, and then hopefully, you know, with us in shared power, we can actually change that scenario. Um, but I do agree with you, um, um, Rabbi Zalman, that, that there is a lot of stress with parents and children in terms of trying, to, um, you know, private tutoring and that competition that's happening uh, in terms of, you know, making sure that kids might be able to get into university or, like I said, what parents think might be a better school. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's taking away from, uh, you know, from children's other activities and just, you know, enjoying life as a young person, frankly. They come home from school and many of them go off to tuition or on weekends. And I think that itself has an impact. Yes, absolutely, it does too, you're correct. Um, our next question, this week there has been a focus on high achieving students with an ATAR, I think it was 85 plus, receiving a scholarship or bursary to encourage them to enter the teaching profession. Do the Greens believe that high ATAR results are the only indication of someone who has the potential to be a teacher? Or do you believe there are other criteria, um, considering that it's said to be a calling and, and there should be a passion involved? Uh, how do we assess it for university entry? Well, you know, teaching for me was an absolute calling. Although I wasn't a school teacher, I was a university teacher. And uh, when I was very young, my mom tells me that if someone would ask me what I wanted to be in life, I would always say a teacher. Uh, being a politician was never on the radar for me. Um, so, you know, when I became a, a teacher at university, I had reached, you know, my, my ambition. But life had other things in store for me as well. Um, so I think the, the important thing is to get people excited about being teachers um, and there's a number of ways that we um, we need to do that I mean in the culture that I grew up in um, teachers were the most respected people next to your parents that's the way uh, it was because you know they we all have a teacher in our lives who has sparked you know passion in in us about something um, and you know they they it's because of teachers that we learn so much. So I think in Australia, there is a bit of a lack of that. Of course, we've seen New South Wales teachers on strike um, recently um, and for better pay and conditions. So, you know, that's another thing um, that is really important for us to do to get people excited to be in this profession. Um, and, and of course, ATAR should not be the only criteria. There can be so many different pathways um, to become a teacher, you know, what about if you want to become a teacher a bit later in life? Um, and, you know, so I think there are other ways as well. Um, I mean, at the moment, we do have um, kind of ATAR is one measure of uh, how you get into university and into a teaching course. Um, but there, there are so many things that need to be addressed. And it just can't be that one measure, uh, which is the only pathway to becoming a teacher. Thank you. Agreed. Um, the National Disability Standards requires schools to make reasonable adjustments for students with additional needs, but parents want the necessary adjustments. 
that their child needs to access education. What are your thoughts and what would the Greens feel is a reasonable adjustment? Mm. I mean, to be frank, all schools should be able to provide for each and every student's individual needs. I mean, that's the ultimate that I would like a public schools um, to get to. I mean, of course, all schools should be accessible um, and individual needs of individual students have to be met, but we are a bit far away from that at the moment. Um, and, and also, um, you know, like all Australians with a disability have a right to good education like any other students. They're no different from any other student. So um, with our kind of platform um, this time around, we actually do want to invest an initial 10 million over four years to co-design a national inclusive education transition plan with um, you know, disabled people, families and disability representative organizations, teachers, um, you know, parents and unions and education experts um, and building inclusive education into tertiary qualifications and giving all you know, pre-service and in-service teachers and principals the opportunity to train, retrain and regularly upskill in inclusive education practices uh, by investing, I think we have costed it at $400 million over um, four years. Uh, and also, as I said, the infrastructure fund that we have set aside also you know, can be and should be used for making current schools accessible. I mean, every child should be able to access the learning and support that they need. Um, and having disability loading based on actual need of the student, uh, no matter where they are. Yes, that would go a long way to making sure they do get the uh, adjustments that they, they need. And um, I love the fact that you just said that you would co-design because I think that is so important and will bring much better results with Absolutely. your obviously designing with the people who are the end user. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, family engagement is missing from most pre-service teacher training, yet as parents, we see the relationship between home and school as paramount to student success. And there are decades now of um, research that, that says that is the case. Um, so would the Greens be in a position or do you have policy that supports firstly a greater emphasis on this in pre-service training? And secondly, would the Greens support the funding of programs that link home to school and engage families? Mm -hmm. Would they promote and fund, would the Greens promote and fund community liaison offices? Mm -hmm. I mean, as we know, schools, uh, school communities are more than teachers and students. Parents pay, play such a key role. I mean, I remember when my two kids were at school, you know, I was working at the canteen, part of PNC, there's so much work that parents do when children come home, you know, part of the work that they do with students. I mean, teachers firstly need to be resourced and supported with enough time, um, you know, and of course, whatever else they need so that they can engage more fully with parents. I mean, we know how stressed teachers are at the moment and it is becoming harder. So um, although we don't really have a specific policy on community liaison officers, but it's it seems to me like, you know, that would be, um, um, you, you know, a good way of looking at it. And also for, you know, migrant families um, as well. I think community liaison officers could play a pretty key role uh, in, in that as well, um, Sharon. Yes, absolutely. There, there would be many um, facets to their positions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know how overstretched teachers are. Um, so, you know, support to, to make their jobs easier and to improve our learning and teaching makes complete sense. Yes. Um, so we saw in the 7.30 report that there is a perceived migration from government schools to low fee paying non-government schools. Um, and often there's a talk about the lack of resources and funding and teacher shortages in the government system. And that can make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. So what would the Greens do to turn this around? And how can we get departments of education and politicians to promote the value of living and learning in your local community? Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. I mean, we, I saw that 7.30 as well, and I just 
just get angry uh, when I, you know, you kind of, we know all of this, but when we hear it again, um, it is a pretty depressing state of affairs, how different Australia is from OECD countries in that respect. You know, we know that OECD average is about kind of 11% of um, children going to non-government schools in Australia, it's going up to about 36%. Um, but it, it, that wasn't the case, you know, uh, 30 years ago, it was th the opposite. And um, as you know, we also spend much less um, in, on um, public funding on, uh, on public schools compared to OECD um, standards. Um, and um, I mean, for me, the key really is about making sure that each and every school, um, in no matter what neighborhood it is, is, is a fully funded public school. Um, and and to be able to do that, you know, people often ask us this question, you know, oh, you, you know, the Greens want the world. Uh, how are you going to pay for it? I mean, it really comes down to priorities. Um, um, you know, stage three tax cuts, for instance, put in $184 billion in the pockets of the wealthiest in this country. Um, you could completely fully fund um, every single public schools to the, uh, school to the SRS standard. Um, by 2023 and ha have left over $150 billion of that money. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, I, I, I just think if schools are funded, they, they, will, they are able to provide the best quality um, education for our students. And there would be no need to be really frank. As you said, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy um, when there is this perception that, you know, private schools, um, are better, even though the results of, you know, if we if we do want to talk about um, ATARs and all of that, because that is a measure that people um, see um, um, as, as a comparative measure, even if we look at that, you know, public schools pro are amazing um, in that respect. Um, but of course, the facilities and the infrastructure and, um, you know, the orchestra pits and the swimming pools, um, are all there in private schools because they do get so much funding. Um, so, um, yeah, like we just need to stop the special deals um, and, um, you know, kind of fill this gap of neglect for public schools. Thank you. Yes, and I think um, you're right. Priority is the key word there. And uh, it's always interesting to me personally that we hear people talking about the need to up our rankings in the OECD, but like you say, the investment in public schools in those leading countries is very much different and far superior to what we we have here. So completely I'm not different. sure why that link isn't made, but anyway, that's and it's just lifelong me. education. Yeah, absolutely, mm. Shan. It's not just public schools; it's early childhood education. It's you know TAFE and universities. It's you know we are kind of departed going further and further away from kind of comparative countries. And I think you spoke about local schools and children going to local schools, it does develop a really strong local community as well. I remember growing up as a kid, most of the kids in the neighborhood went to the same school. Um, and it was just, um, in, you know, like there were so many commonalities, you know, we could, um, you know, one parent would drive all the kids, you know, to, to the school and pick them yeah. up. And it really does um, build a community it as well. It is community building, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Um, School learning support officers or teachers aides, they're called different things in different states. Um, they're great assets to a classroom, but their pay is not representative of the work many of them do. There's quite a difference in skill base and role. Mm. Would the green support arise to the status of the para of paraprofessional support a unique, excuse me, a unique piece of professional learning and a pathway into teaching for them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, teachers aides are crucial um, to the work teachers do. And as you said, you know, like childcare workers and early childhood educators, they, their responsibility and the level of work that they do is not is not recognized in the pay that they get. Um, so and, and as for teachers as well, it's a similar story. So um, yeah, absolutely. I think they are crucial to to the um, to our children and our schools and our teachers, um, and they they should be um, paid accordingly. And sh like I said earlier, there should be so many pathways to t teaching. Um, and and while you know this isn't 
uh, part of our policy, but um, because we haven't looked at each and every aspect of particularly teachers' aids, but again, it it, it seems to me that th that is a way as well of, you know, how there is a kind of a dearth of teachers. That's a way of providing pathway to teaching as well. Yes, it would be excellent. We've got a lot of uh, fabulous teachers' aides and um, SOs out there who would be great running a classroom on their own. So Absolutely. yeah, that's lovely to hear. I might just throw and see if there are any questions from our listeners. Um, being technically challenged, is there someone in my team who can <laughs> tell me if there are? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, uh, thanks, and I, can, I can read one from Gail McCarty. Following on from the family engagement topic, uh, would the Greens support funding for teacher home school visits to build the relationship with families and an understanding, sorry, an understanding learning to support students for the future? Sorry, did, did that come out right? Did you want me to read that one again? No, that's all right. I just don't have it in front of me, um, Diane. Oh, oh, you do? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our first priority, to be frank, is to to get teachers a fair pay, um, to have fair funding and fully fund 100% SRS. Um, I uh, like, and we are still a bit far away from that. And I don't want to place additional burdens on teachers um, when they're already um, stretched. Um, but yeah, absolutely very happy um, to take this on board and, and have more of a think about it. Fabulous, thank you. Um, if anybody else has any questions they'd like to pop in there or does any anybody from my team have a question that they would like to ask the Senator? Not at this point. I was clicking the wrong button. Um, <laughs> I'm, just to follow on from that family engagement stuff, it's a bit of a bent of ours. Um, we'd be more than happy to work with you on mm. any any sort of policy development that you yeah. do that, I think. Um, so Absolutely. I think that would be terrific. Let's do that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, families, when they're involved, we know that it has better outcomes for students. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, and and when and when uh, teachers and parents talk together and Absolutely. understand and understand both lots of knowledge, then I think it's really helpful to progress Agreed. young people. Agreed. Agreed. It's more along the lines of that co-design that you were speaking about Absolutely. earlier. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're um, we haven't got any more questions popping up, so we might let you. Go a little bit early <laughs> off to your next appointment. I know it won't be a relaxing <laughs> evening. I know there's lots more to come. I know, um, I know. Oh, All the Zoom so is fantastic. You know, we discovered Zoom during COVID and it's really fantastic. But now when we've kind of opened up, it's Zoom and running around with faces. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, Sharon, there is another question. If, if, if you've got a second, Senator. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, uh, this is from Natasha. With, with funding being the sticking point across the board, what other ways can we improve the lot of public education? Uh, we, are seeing, we are seeing it's a sort of an elephant in the room discussion when it's coming to the two major parties at the moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so this is our plan. And I think we will get there at this election. So at the moment, what um, you, you know, different polling is suggesting is that the Greens will be the largest third party ever in the Senate, and we will hold um, the, the balance of power. And so public education it is a priority for us. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not willing to accept that we, uh, you know, we look at, I guess, tinkering around the edges or in, you know, small changes here or there. Um, and kind of be content with that. I mean, funding is the sticking point. I really do think funding is the sticking point um, at the moment in public education. So um, I would really want to push for funding. I think labor is moving a little bit on that, uh, you know, not as much as we would like them to, um, but they are moving a little bit on that. I'm not quite sure how how else we improve um, resourcing in schools if we cannot provide um, the funding that is required, to be really frank. 
Uh, we do have another policy as well, which um, we put out last time, which is, um, you know, to support, um, you know, I think there is a charity that runs um, a breakfast program for students, for instance, and this is particularly focused on students because we know in some areas, many students go hungry at school. Um, so just talking about that, providing more funding so that, you know, students um, get the, the breakfast and the lunches that we need as is practiced in many of the European countries. I think pay is another factor. And I think labor is probably moving on that. Uh, and that's, I know, in a state by state issue. But I feel that in New South Wales, there is a move um, towards acknowledging that they, they will, um, um, you know, end that freeze on public sector uh, workers may become um, the next budget before the next election. So, you know, and that is another way of at least um, giving teachers, um, you know, some um, relief. Um, but I uh, mean, I, I can't get past the fact that we do need the resources and those resources will come through funding. Yes, it does all seem to come back to funding and not necessarily how much funding, but where that is directed for us. That's exactly, so, exactly yeah. right, exactly yeah. right. And giving teachers as well, I think um, the schools and teachers working with parents a bit more kind of autonomy in how, um, you know, they um, basically, uh, how those schools run. Yes, which happens to varying degrees across yes. the Commonwealth. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 Terrific. Well, thank you very much. As far as I can see, there are no other questions popping up. So <laughs> a second thank you. Um, we really do appreciate your time, Senator. It's been um, most generous of you to spend this evening with us. And we look forward to the next couple of weeks and, and seeing the outcome, on, well, hopefully, on the 21st. But thank you again for your time this evening. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. And let's talk more about the things we, um, we, we're thinking we need to develop a bit more on. So let's do that after the 21st. And yeah, fingers crossed. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good Thanks, night. everyone.